Hi there, everyone. This is Chris McDonald and Larry Miner, and um, just wanted to welcome you to the How to Host an Unforgettable Turkey Trot. Um, Johanna's on as well, but I think she's having a little bit of technical difficulties um, on her audio. So um, without further ado, uh, we will go ahead and jump right in with Larry and uh, how to host a, uh, a successful turkey trot. Hey everyone, I'm Larry, um, sales rep here at Run Sign Up as well as a race timer. And we're gonna go through some tips on hosting a hybrid event for this year's turkey trot. So kind of an overview of today's agenda. We'll initially go over welcoming you to give sign up, run sign up, getting to know us, and then lead into race plans for this year's turkey trot season, uh, some social marketing tools that we offer, and then Chris will take away with some race day tips, ways to make race day fun, and then we'll wrap it up with some questions. So again, welcome to Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up, uh, where our goal is to offer you a purpose-built technology for endurance events and nonprofits. Quick little background on Run Sign Up. So it was founded in 2010 with an objective to bring better technology to endurance events. This is done through event registration, promotional tools, integrated fundraising, and race day capabilities. Uh, it also offers purpose-built fundraising technology for nonprofits by offering event fundraising as well as online giving and just some quick stats about the company um, some of the highlights uh, in the short time that we've been around we're taking just about 30 percent a little over 30 percent of the endurance market share space currently working with over 25,000 events per year and in the times we've been around we've had over 2,000 uh, product releases with just a staggering four minutes of downtime since 2015 which is really impressive it's so a quick uh, diagram that kind of explains give sign up, run sign up, how we are one platform with two purpose built solutions. So on the left, you'll see that our give sign up platform is more focused on our nonprofits through ticketing events, fundraising campaigns, and online donations. As you slowly, slowly transition into run sign up, you'll notice that we work more with memberships like clubs and teams, as well as registrations for runs, walks, and rides, and then also some uh, race day tools for our timers. So looking at turkey trots, uh, of course, turkey trot is or turkey trots are typically one of the uh, larger running days in the U.S. 2020 did uh, take a pretty impactful hit from the pandemic. Uh, numbers for 2020 were down 70% compared to 2019. Uh, this was majority of these uh, races that were impacted were the large scale races. So local community events weren't affected as drastically. Um, just to kind of put that in perspective, in 2019, we had 159 races with over 1,000 participants, whereas in 2020, we were limited to 31 events that were able to get uh, over 1,000 participants. So, Let's go into race plan for this year with some contingencies, trying to overcome the odds of uh, everything you're gonna be up against with the pandemic and come up with some new ways to keep your participation numbers uh, increasing. So one of the first ways we recommend doing that is thinking hybrid. Uh, we like to follow the 99% rule. So 99% of the time, it's best to set up a virtual and a live option as separate events to accommodate the different needs for each uh, event. So an example of this would be if you're hosting a 5K for your turkey trot that's in person, you could also host alongside that a virtual 5K uh, or a 10K, either one. Basically by doing this, it's more inclusive, it allows something for everyone, and you can embrace the tradition of turkey trots by welcoming friends and family from around the world who might not be able to participate in person. Setting up hybrid events is very similar to setting up in-person events. Uh, it's gonna be done in step one of the Race Wizard. So uh, just like I said, setting up an in-person event, you're gonna name your event, in which case for a virtual event, you wanna name the event virtual uh, 5K or 10K, whichever you're hosting, and then make sure that your event type is selected as virtual and race. Um, you'll also notice generally uh, virtual races are a little bit less in price for registration than in-person races. So kind of keep that in mind when you're setting your registration prices. 
Customizing your date and location, this is something you want to pay close attention to as well, being that you are going to be hosting two events, uh, one being in person and at a designated location at a specific time, and a uh, virtual event, which was going to take place throughout the course of possibly a week leading up to your in-person event. You want to make sure that there isn't any kind of misunderstanding that the virtual event is taking place at a specific location, but instead virtually anywhere uh, your participants are. So just making sure that you're conscious of setting up your location and the event date uh, so you don't run into any confusion there. We also allow you the capability to insert um, custom text for your race location. So if you just have a race address where your race is going to be taking place at, you can add in some custom text to let people know exactly where the starting area is going to be. So there's no confusion there, um, as well as the ability to show directions on our map feature. Um, and this can also be something that you can either display or choose to take away if it's if it's for some reason is too confusing for your participants, um, but you can add those in. And then for your virtual races, just also adding a note, allowing people to know that it's virtually and can be run anywhere. So some of these settings, even though they are for uh, the same overall event, they're going to be separate. So your virtual and in-person events should have some different requirements there. Uh, as we were saying, event dates, your in-person uh, date is going to be the day of the in-person event, as well as the location. Uh, for a virtual event, you're going to have possibly a week-long span, so make sure your dates are all accurate. Uh, as, and also conscious of your um, confirmation emails, so that they are... Uh, also informing your participants that of those timeframes. Um, Follow-up registration emails as well. Corrals is something that you want to be sure uh, for in-person events that your participants are aware of so that they know which corral, that, which corral time they're showing up for. Uh, swag shipping is going to be an option for your virtual events. So if you're offering swag that's going to be shipped, you want to make sure that's set up and that your participants are aware of those shipping options different result sets for each, uh, for in-person and virtual, and then of course, uh, digital and finisher certificates that you wanna set up as well. So there are some settings that you're gonna wanna combine. Um, this is to kinda help make everything more cohesive uh, for your event, and make it feel like it's actual, everyone's competing in the same event. So allowing your participants to upload photos, create social teams and incentives, you can also turn on your referral and swag rewards, as well as fundraising and social media posts. So all things that are going to kind of help to bring that familiar feel of an in-person race, even if you are competing virtually. Going through the virtual event checklist, initially, uh, as we were saying, you're going to want to set up your virtual event in your race wizard in step one. After that, you can progress to setting up your shipping information and then configuring your result sets for your virtual event. Once you've done that, uh, we can look into some of these add-on features like photo setup. Uh, if you're setting up a challenge, you can set up activity types and goals, as well as badges and milestones. Team integration, again, is a great way to kind of bring it all together so that there's some competitiveness amongst teams. And then if you would like to look into race joy, that's a conversation you could have with your local timer. Another thing to be conscious of is just being flexible this year. Coming off of the 2020 pandemic, uh, a lot of participants are hesitant and uh, possibly gonna be looking to, to transfer from uh, maybe your virtual event as the in-person event grows near and they uh, sense that it's actually going to take place. So making it easy for your participants if they are signed up for the virtual event and they would like to transfer into the in-person event, um, just wanna make that as seamless as possible. Participants are going to want to transfer. Some are going to want to defer to next year if they, for whatever reason, don't feel comfortable this year coming out to the event. So you want to make sure that's also pretty seamless as well as race transfers. So just allowing them to opt out and uh, attend another race that better fits their circumstances. So goals of 2020, 2021 participant management, uh, clear communication, participants about their status of the registration and any actions needed, uh, bulk actions for participation update to save them time, um, self-serve actions when possible. So if they can transfer or defer on their own, having those settings set up will save you a lot of time and headache. Uh, ensuring all of your participants end up with the right solution to their 2020 issues. So there are going to be some participants that last year, for whatever reason, 
the issues that they were running into. Maybe they just don't feel like they're resolved completely. So you want to make sure that those are taken care of moving forward and that your tran your policies are, are transparent. So if you do have a cancellation policy, you just want to make sure that that is front and center and there's you know not going to be any questions about that, as well as uh, refunds for your event this year. So that leads into step three, communicate. Communication is going to be key. Um, share your options and specifics of your virtual in-person event in every stage of your communication. So from the communicate, uh, from the confirmation email to the register, uh, registration follow-up emails, your website cover page, and then uh, a website frequently asked questions section is definitely a good place just to put those uh, high-level questions that your participants might have about uh, restrictions or any kind of mandates in your area for your event that'll kind of alleviate any confusion there so if you can get those on your website those would definitely help to save some time with questions uh, so event specific confirmation email just want to make sure that your event specific confirmation email goes out that if there's any information um, pertinent to that event it's all covered within that email and these can be set up again within the dashboard under your race notifications and you can send out this email as well as a registration follow-up email which we'll go over in just a second so enabling the registration follow-up email is just going to make sure that your participants are aware of registration how everything's going uh, you can select the intervals and save the settings for this and then customize the advanced settings so we'll look into that so advanced settings for the confirmation uh, registration follow-up email, similar separation of details as for the event-specific confirmation email. Um, must use the advanced setup to customize lists for in-person and virtual. So you see there you have the option for which events you want to add or, in, or exclude from this email. So just making sure that that's set up properly. Event-specific email information to include um, for both confirmation and registration uh, follow-up emails. You want to include for virtual events how a virtual race works, so making sure everyone understands that. The dates and time for completion, deadline caps, uh, process for transferring to in-person if you're going to allow that. Again, swag shipping timeline when they need to have those um, orders in, and then how to uh, upload your virtual results. <clears throat> for in-person events, location always important. Corral times, making sure that uh, your participants are showing up for the proper corral time. Any kind of link to social distancing protocols in your area. Um, deadline and process for transferring to virtual. And then of course, where packet pickup is gonna be located. For your website on your cover page, this is a great place to kind of put those highlights of any kind of information that's gonna be really important um, for your participants so that they are fully aware of like I said, any kind of restrictions or COVID protocols in your area, um, this is going to be what they see front and center when they log on to the registration page. So adding this in as a frequently asked questions page or just right on that cover page will definitely help to get your point across and make sure that your participants are fully informed to any kind of uh, information for your event. Social marketing uh, and virtual social marketing. Next thing we're going to discuss. So referral rewards. Uh, referral rewards are actually beneficial for everyone. 17% of registration dollars were, for, were from referral rewards in 2020. So some of the ways that it benefits the race, it's easy to set up, automate, and track. Uh, it's also your participants become an ambassador for your race. So they're helping to promote your event uh, as well as you. So it's kind of like free marketing. The ways that it uh, benefits the participants, it's easy to share, track, and earn referral rewards. Um, incentives to earn uh, refunds or exclusive race swag, or maybe even both in some cases. And it's the first step to creating a shared experience with family and friends. So getting those family and friends out and participating with them, this is a great way to kind of incentivize that. Creating your referral programs, uh, just in a few quick steps. So something that you can do from within the dashboard and the promotionals tab, getting set up, setting up refund rewards if you uh, want to have thresholds for um, certain certain levels of getting uh, referrals. You can have refunds, you can have swag rewards, social sharing, promoting your event, and then of course sending out your reminder emails of these different reward options. 
Groups and teams is another way to kind of encourage your friends and family to come out and join. It's another great way to compete with your family and friends. 30% uh, of participants join teams when they are available. Uh, this, is all, this is holding true even through post-coronavirus. Uh, teams can be either 100% social for fun, so no competitive consequence. They can be competitive teams, which allow you to compete against other teams with uh, scoring and also fundraising, so focused on raising money, but not necessarily all participants. So a few great ways to kind of incentivize joining teams um, for whatever reason you'd like to do it. Again, incentivizing groups and teams. Uh, you can also set up automated uh, discounts and refunds for anyone on a team that hits a certain size. This satisfies the discount demand while incentivizing price-sensitive participants to recruit family and friends. So an example of this would be if regular registration for $39 with a $5 discount for members of groups of more than five. So the first four registrants pay $39, while the fifth registrant and everyone after it would pay $34, and then the first four would be refunded that $5. So just another way to incentivize uh, creating groups and teams and hitting certain thresholds with those. Social media matters, so promoting your event and building your community. Um, add and make social media handles like hashtags and whatnot through, um, through social media such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Invite people to follow your race, uh, your confirmation emails, your marketing. Again, creating a hashtag for your event is a great way to promote, uh, make it much easier to search for your event. And then customize any kind of uh, social sharing image that shows special shows anything special about your event to kind of separate yourself from what is going to be many other turkey trots taking place this fall. So some of our email marketing features uh, use email marketing to spread the word about your social marketing opportunities. Just like with rewards, uh, there's different stages of this. So just letting your participants know that we're open, we're we're actually having our event. Um, you can also send incomplete registration emails, let people know that may have started setting up their uh, registration and didn't finish that. Uh, registration follow-up emails, making your participants aware of any kind of price increases or special promotions, and then pre-race emails, just letting everyone know how things are going to take place on race day and, and what they should expect. And now Chris will take it away with your race day. Yes. So give me one second to switch over presenters. Thank you, Larry. All right. So you you got everything set up on Run Sign Up. You've uh, done all this extra work. You marketed. You got your volunteers. Um, and so now it's race day. How do you make this a successful day of? So first things first, um, we do need to address the elephant in the room. We do have some best practices here and some no-nos. Um, it goes without saying at this point, we're, I can't even say 18 months in, I don't know how long we've been under COVID protocols. It's been a while. So if you've been putting on races already, um, you know. Um, but if you haven't, and this is your first one in a COVID world, um, some best practices are always following the state and local guidelines and always lean back on those. It, it helps um, so you're not opening yourself up to your own interpretation of what you should be doing. Um, you look into your testing and vaccination options, um, providing outdoor packet pickup and any other outdoor options when possible. Um, Pre-package everything that you possibly can. Um, I realize that it's a little wasteful, but at the same time, it removes um, uh, touch, uh, any touch in between volunteers um, and athletes. Um, so you can also ask your volunteers and race staff to wear masks and be at a safe distance. And anybody that's not feeling well, you know, stay home. Um, so in terms of what you're doing on the run sign up side, uh, you can ask for um, participants to agree to your COVID policy. You can build that into your, um, your waiver if you want to. You can ask them to agree to um, any, follow any state, local CDC guidelines while being there. Um, 
and you can change your waiver policies. Um, you can even let them know that on site you're going to be requiring whatever you want to. You know, it's your event. However, um, please do not ask if the participant is vaccinated um, or if anyone, whether it be the participant or anyone else uh, joining them, um, has had or currently has COVID. Um, these are health requirements and um, we do want to be wary of all HIPAA guidelines. So again, um, you can ask uh, for people to agree to your policies, but don't ask um, specifically during the registration part um, about vaccination. You can do that on site if you like, but not during the registration process. So also, um, and, and we're not gonna say start this on race day or, or the day before race day, but um, you know, a few weeks, a few months out, begin working with your timer. Um, in many scenarios, the timer is a race consultant as well. Um, we did a timer survey uh, a couple of years ago, and I think 78 or something percent of all timers um, timed more than 10 events a year, uh, some over 100 events a year. So they do this a lot. You as a race director might be putting this race on uh, one time, and, and this might be your first time, or you might be doing this annually, but you're only doing it once a year. Um, so your timer has a lot more experience, works with a lot more events and can be a great resource. Um, and so ask questions to them. Uh, a lot of times they'll help out with um, a lot of different facets of your event and can help really support you um, and, uh, and, and your athletes. Um, we put a list together in terms of finished management, some help with packet pickup, race day registration, um, and maybe not registration specifically, but maybe they have... Uh, kiosks or, or whatnot, or, or they can help you with QR codes um, to point people to online registration. They can help set up your race course or manage your race course. Um, there's a lot of different start line strategies in the COVID world, and they can help you with that side of it. Um, uh, and most timers um, set up to some degree finish lines and then um, can, can help with your the tracking of participants on course, both in person and virtual. So um, well, I put this together a, a while ago um, in regards to your old timeline, and, and and I'm not making the or I am making the assumption that you're doing something that that a lot of people did, you know, maybe five years ago or ten years ago, and it might not have changed. Um, and we're going to tell you some ways that you can change it to help both your athletes, your volunteers, and your staff. So the old way of doing things was you would open registration. There's no notable di noticeable difference. Um, then you would close registration on say, maybe not Wednesday for a turkey trot. Maybe it would be like Monday or Tuesday. But if it's a Saturday event, we would close registration on Wednesday. Um, so nobody else can register until the day before the event. Um, at that point, you would export the registration uh, registrants. You'd pull them into a, a CSV um, on your computer. Um, and, in, and then you would assign bib numbers. You would do it by alpha, by age, or whatever, wave. Um, and then from there, you would import the participants into the timing software or, or the timer would. Um, they would use that to print or apply bib numbers or, or uh, labels on those bibs. And um, at that point, they would set up packet pickup. And, and everything was, was printed out. You had alpha lists, you had your lines, you know, where, where you know, a through C is in this line and, and D through whatever is in the next line. Um, any changes that were made were on paper forms. Any new registrations that came in were on, on paper forms. And so you needed volunteers or runners to take those paper forms and those changes to the change desk or to the timing tent. Um, and then registration would have to close before timing started. And, and so that's because all the bib assignments, everything like that had to be pulled into the scoring platform uh, platform before uh, anything could move forward um, or, or at least until awards or results were ready. Um, so this kind of culminated in like a maximum stress event. Um, and if not for the race director, definitely for the timer. Um, and it was a lot of times events would start late. Um, event registrations weren't entered before um, before the race started. Late changes hadn't been completed. And so the first few people were coming through and results weren't pushing up, if you were even pushing results to the web. 
And so finally you got all the data entered, you hit your Zen moment where the data's in, results are being pushed up, all is well, you print your results. So that's the old way of doing things. So the new timeline is a little different. And this, you know, registration's still on and up, but the new timeline is leaving registration open until you feel like closing it. Now, again, you will wanna to talk to your timer about their services and what they can and can't do. Um, you will need Wi-Fi on, on site if you're gonna do some of these things. So it's very, very important to have these conversations in advance. Um, but you leave registration open until you feel like, or your timer um, feels comfortable closing it. You send a pre-event email um, to all athletes with a QR replacement tag um, at the top that points at their registration ID. And the purpose behind this is people can either bring a printout of that email or they can bring their phone and they can show it at Packet Pickup. And there you have your, your check-in app that's a free app from Run Sign Up. You turn that on and you've set it up so you're dynamically assigning bibs by your QR code. So two things are done here. Um, the, the person's walking up, you're taking your, you're taking your cell phone, you're walking over, you're scanning that QR code that they had on their, on their registration uh, email. It's automatically finding them. You hit the check-in button. It's automatically bringing up the camera again, and you're using the um, QR code on the bib to assign the bib number, which is then automatically saved in Run Sina, and all of those, um, all of those updates and changes are pulled directly into race day scoring if your timer's using race day scoring. Um, so the beauty here is you can push results as soon as the first person hits a timing point. So it, it's very, very seamless. There's a bi-directional sync that allows for multiple changes in real time. So on the packet pickup side, you, you do still wanna like keep these social distancing uh, thoughts in place. Um, you wanna co communicate these plans in advance. Different municipalities have different rules. Um, so you do wanna have a smooth process with spread out stations if possible. You do wanna have a plan to manage or limit crowds. Um, some people are even doing like drive-through packet pickup, um, which is making it so that people don't have to come in and be around each other. Um, and you can you can use this, some people are also using like FM radio transmitters to, to let people know when they can come into packet pickup or into a starting line. Um, text alert, signage, all are important. It's all part of that communication plans. And then you can also use cones, flag dots on the ground to uh, to show safe distances. Um, if you haven't seen these out and around yet, then you have literally been at home for the past 18 months. Good for you. But the likelihood that you have been to say the grocery store, the bank, something like that, and seen like you know six feet safe distance um, spots uh, is pretty normal at this point. On the pickups, uh, the packet pickup side, a lot of other events have also started mailing out packets, especially if you have a virtual component. So there are pluses and minuses to this. The pluses are obviously you don't have to have as many people at packet pickup. Yay. Um, the minus though is you are going to incur extra costs, and this is not necessarily just on the cost of um, your your postage. You also have uh, the labels cost money. The, the poly mailer bags cost money. The, um, the, the, you're gonna need to probably pay, if you don't have um, volunteers to do it, you're gonna need to pay someone to do it. Um, and you have a decreased, um, or, or actually an increased lead time because you're, you're, or decreased lead time, so you're having to increase your, your schedule of orders out. Um, and you're gonna have some athletes that lose their bids or lose them in the mail. Um, so again, there are big pluses. There are also things to consider on the flip side. Um, so if you do this, you will want to turn on the shipping management tools to verify correct addresses. Um, and in these scenarios, you're going to obviously, since we're, you know, U.S. for these turkey trots, you're going to want to make sure you're limiting um, the uh, U.S. shipping addresses for the in-person races. So we talked about some start line options. Here's some really, really quick ones. Um, mass start is your normal, everybody starts at once. Limited wave start, this is where, you know, X amount of people start every few minutes. Um, you'll probably wanna let people know this in advance. Um, then there's the time trial start. This could be one or two people start every few seconds. Thing with uh, some of these wave and time trial starts, you will need again to speak with your timer and make sure you have mass there because you will likely be moving from a gun start or a gun time to a chip time. 
um, for awards. A grid start, which is what the uh, the image uh, on the screen is, where you have uh, you, you can do waves. You don't have to do a mass start with a grid. You could do waves of 50 or something like that every few minutes. Everybody starts at once, or, or every wave starts when it's supposed to. Um, but but um, in those scenarios, if you are doing these type, you still probably with the grid, you likely still want to have um, a map at the start since you're requiring people to stand back from the starting area. Um, you can also have an open start finish area. Um, <clears throat> and this is where you give like a huge window, two hour window for people to start at their leisure. Um, and, and so there's pluses and minuses there. Obviously you have to keep the roads closed for longer. You need volunteers for longer, things like that, but it does spread everyone out. And then, you know, turkey trots, not so much needing a multi-day event, open start finish. Um, but you do, if, if for some reason you are going to go that route, you do need to think about how you're going to allocate resources. Finish lines. Um, so in person, you're going to think about two main options here, a separate start finish and a shared start finish. Um, the type of finish line you have is going to be dictated by multiple factors. One being the distance, the shorter distance, usually you have to go to a separate start finish line earlier. Event size, the larger events are going to need to go to a separate start finish line earlier. If you have a, a limited staff and volunteers, you're likely going to consider keeping everything in one spot um, and equipment. So if your timer or you, if you are the timer, only has one decoder or two decoders and both need to be at the finish, you know, and, and you need to do a time trial start, you might have to share the start and finish. So just keep all of these in mind when you're planning things out. So results, so you, you have in-person results delivery and virtual, some of these kind of uh, overlap, but um, for in-person, you do wanna ensure text and email notifications are turned on. Um, if, you, if you need to know how to do that, you can go into uh, Race Day Tools, results and results notifications. Um, so for this year continued, there's gonna be a limited need for kiosk and scrolling TV screens. You've worked really hard on spreading people out in most scenarios, so you don't wanna turn around and then have like gathering points. Um, so uh, using these text notifications and e email notifications are a really, really great way to get results out there. Again, talk to your timer, make sure they can pull, push these results uh, live to the web. You can also post QR codes around the site um, and, and these can point at your results page. Um, it's a really quick and easy way. So you don't have to say, go back to the run sign up registration page. You just have a QR code up at your event and people can walk up with their phone, scan the QR code, and it points at the results. Um, and then instead of having a PDF or, or a printed out PDF awards list from the timer, you can have it emailed to you because um, most of the time you're pushing those results live. Most timers can save the results as a PDF instead of having to hand things back and forth from each other. Um, you don't even have to go to the timing tent. They can email you and then say, hey, just emailed you the PDF results. And then you can utilize your phone or an iPad or, uh, or a, an Android tablet or something like that to uh, read off results, especially if you're doing awards in a different place than the finish line. Virtual results, you are going to want to enable virtual results at race day uh, or under race day tools, virtual challenge results and configure the virtual results. You're going to want to keep those results set separate from the in-person results and make it very, very clear. Um, again, we talked about that earlier. And then you're going to provide a wide window for participants to report self-report their time. Um, and then you'll probably want to put a, a min max uh, to prevent somebody saying that, you know, they ran a 12 minute 5K, uh, you know, 12 year boy ran a 12 minute 5K. Um, and then most uh, virtual results uh, or virtual events do not do awards. Um, part of that's just because there is a lot of uh, room for people to uh, run the course they want to run downhill or bike instead of run. So uh, it's not necessarily fair for awards. So the tools available to you. Um, you have the Race Day Check-In app. Um, it's been updated in the past uh, month or two. Um, it's now green, so if the last time you used it, it was black, or if the last time you used it, it was two-tone blue, go back in, double check to make sure it is a green icon. Um, you do, you do want to use this. Um, you want to clear out your database if the last time you used it was last year. Um, and then, the beauty of this is it syncs with the entire race day suite for timing, scoring, and registration. Um, all you have to do is pull down or it does update every minute or so. Um, it allows for easy use of dynamic bib assignment. 
it'll scale quickly, especially if you've uploaded things to the cloud, uh, like your configurations. And uh, it's great for reporting check-in totals by device and um, check-in bandwidth over time. The benefit there is you can begin like a few weeks after your turkey trot, you can go back in and look at these reports and say, look, we need more packet pickup volunteers. We, we need more lines for next year in between this time and this time. So it's a really great resource for your after action plans. Um, and we have plenty of uh, videos on how to set up and manage your check-in app. Um, but a quick overview, you do want to enable the app. If, you, if you're going in right now and downloading it while I'm talking to you, you're like, hey, my event's not in there. I don't understand. My event's on run sign up. I have the app. Well, you have to enable the app and those enabled dates have to be open presently. So once that's done, you can set a password. Um, I will say in your password hint, um, I would strongly advise you to consider putting your actual password for the app in there. Do not make your, pa uh, your app password the same thing as your run signup password. Make it something super easy like uh, turkey123 or something like that. Um, that way, uh, if you have to tell a volunteer, you're not telling a volunteer your password. Uh, so once you've got that set up, about 30 seconds later, you can find the event in the app. You can go in um, and update the settings, save those settings, um, upload those to the cloud on your primary device, and then on all other devices, you can download those configurations from the cloud, then you're off to checking in. So I personally would suggest you do this on like Monday or Tuesday of event week. So you're not trying to do this on site at Packet Pickup if your Packet Pickup for your turkey trot is on, on Wednesday. Some really good recommend, uh, recommendations for, uh, for setting up the check-in app, require the bib, auto show camera on bib assignment, um, this is if you're using barcodes or QR codes on your bibs to dynamically assign. Show the giveaway. The giveaway is going to be whatever you set up to give away to people, whether it be, you know, a hat or tickets or or T-shirts or sweatshirts or whatever. Um, allow uncheck-ins, prevent duplicate bibs, and validate bibs. There's plenty of additional settings, um, and you, you can also set it to your allow event transfers, things like that. Um, so go in and, and play around with those if you want to set up a test event. Um, or if you have questions, reach out and we can help you through that process. So here is, let's see if I can get this to play. Um, here is the check-in app in motion. So the person handed their, their ID, they're searching for it um, because they didn't have their, uh, their QR code. They found, found it, you can see the green check-in button's ready to go. They flip the bib over, they scan it and boom, they just assign, dynamically assign the bib and they're writing the name on the back with a t-shirt size. This specific event had t-shirt pickup in a different location. Um, and so all within 20, 25 seconds, um, the entire packet pickup process was done. So um, you can, we've gotten this down to like seven or eight seconds. Um, if you do a double QR code, a QR code scan for finding the person and a QR code scan for signing the bib, it goes very, very quickly. So race joy, um, this is exclusive through uh, race day certified timers. Um, and it's a great way to elevate the turkey trot experience, um, especially if you're doing a hybrid event where you have both virtual and on site, um, because not everyone can be on site. There might be people who are um, very COVID susceptible and need to stay home. But in this scenario, they can still track their family and friends that are on site. You can do custom Thanksgiving themed audio experience. Um, you can do all kinds of things. And you as a race director can sit um, or have a secondary computer open and you can track all the people um, on site that are utilizing the app. So it, it helps you as a race director as well. Um, so here's a couple of their features. Um, you can do progress updates. Uh, results integration and uh, like I said that central monitoring communication system is very very helpful um, and the athletes will get progress updates every mile um, which is super helpful people really like it um, hearing their pace um, and then the uh, the monitoring system allows you to see where people are on dots around the course so uh, a lot of times uh, people will if you don't have split points out on course um, and your lead officer, someone like that, saying, hey, where's that last person we're wanting to open roads up? Um, you know, you, you would have a limiting statement saying the last person using the app is at this location. Um, so there might be somebody behind them not using the app, but you can definitively say if someone is not to that intersection yet, which is very, very helpful. 
So a couple of things that you can do to, uh, to help uh, elevate that experience is create finisher certificates. It's a nice, it's both nice for in-person and for virtual. Um, so the beauty here is if you don't have any, you know, uh, experience developing or doing any kind of fancy artwork, we have a bunch of custom uh, or semi-custom um, uh, finish certificates that you can play around with. Um, all of these fields that you see with the boxes around them, they're all um, fields that are gonna pull in from the Run Sign Up database. So you can upload your own image in the back. You can upload your own bib if you want to. Um, and this links on the result. So when a participant goes in and clicks on their result, it actually has a link to their finisher certificate. Um, it's also a great place as a race director to upsell sponsors um, by telling them, look, every single athlete, we're going to email every single athlete out um, with, with, a, with a virtual bid. And this is a place where you could maybe get additional revenue from people that you couldn't fit on your actual bid. Um, and then race day photos is another upselling opportunity. And it also connects virtual and in-person participants. Um, so people can go in, upload these or, or upload these photos, and you can turn on the tagging where it will um, it, it can tag, or your your photographer can upload photos as well, where um, you can tag by the bib number, and you can also overlay the um, the race logo or a sponsor logo, or what have you. Um, all of these are also uh, searchable both on the Run Sign Up site. And if you click on a participant's uh, result, just below, I think it's just below, the, uh, the finisher certificate is a photo link. And it'll bring them to all the photos that were, uh, that were tagged to them. So uh, again, by, by using this um, branding or by, by putting sponsor logos on there, you're getting more views, more views are more impressions. Um, it's, it equates to revenue for these sponsors. So it's a really great, cost-effective way to driving value for your sponsors and could be a really great selling point um, for you when you're reaching out to people and with that i think we have covered the entirety of the turkey trot experience are there any questions that we need to float out to everyone i don't see any right now that haven't been answered. I'll give it just one more minute. Um, but if we have not answered any questions, we can also get back to you guys uh, later. Cool. And just some other things to think about if you do have questions on specific things that um, that Larry or myself spoke about. Um, on the homepage of Run Sign Up, there's a learning button. Um, and you can go in and look for previous webinars. This is being recorded, this will be there. Um, and then you also have a um, dynamically sortable FAQ log, um, and you have uh, the YouTube. If you go to youtube.com slash run sign up, there's lots and lots of content that will help you learn more about how to most effectively use run sign up as a tool. Uh, here's one actual question um, for Chris. Can you use the check-in app if you are not dynamically assigning bib numbers? Absolutely. So. Um, you, you actually, the only thing you wouldn't do is turn on the camera for, um, for bib assignment because it would already be there. Um, for a lot of triathlons that have waves based on like um, uh, age or category or something like that, like all the Athenas or novices are gonna go in this wave, um, they pre-assign bibs. And so the check-in app is great to use for that because still it, it auto syncs with the database. So as people are registering, it will have the person in there. Something to consider though, if you're not gonna assign bibs um, dynamically, you will want to make sure that you have auto bib assignment turned on at the registration level. Um, and so if you're curious about that, again, on that, those YouTube um, and FAQs, there are how to set up automatic bib assignment. And you can, uh, you can set up bib assignment however you want to up until a certain point. And then after that point say, you know, we're gonna chronologize or, or numerically assign bibs after that. So that the next person registers gets bib number 701. And the person after that, even if they were on their phone, gets bib number 702. And that way it's gonna sync with the app. And I think the app updates, it's either every 30 or 60 seconds. So somebody's in line actively registering, it will take a moment for it to populate. Um, or you can pull down, or you can just search directly for the person and it will find them a bit faster. 
Um, but absolutely, you can 100% use the, the check-in app with pre-assigned VIP numbers. The last one uh, I can answer, yes, tomorrow we will post both the video and a copy of the slides to the blog. Um, we'll also email it to you guys uh, if that's faster, but we will have the slides too if you just want to refer back to you know a checklist that he went through without watching the whole thing over. I think that looks like it's it. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, Larry. Thank you Thanks guys. everyone for coming. Mm -hmm.